Before we start, someone like to lead us in prayer? Thank you, Daryl. Heavenly Father, thank you for putting us in this wonderful place that you have provided for us to live and grow. Help each of us here, Lord, to learn from the study of your word and know how best to serve you. On the personal note, Lord, thank you for Lark Hill and her family and all that you bring to us throughout this study. Reach out your guiding hand, Lord, to our elected officials at all levels. Help them to know how best to serve you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last week we uh, finished up in, the, in chapter 16, and it was the story of, uh, of Paul, Paul and Silas and um, their encounter with a, a young woman who was a slave, a servant, and um, who was possessed by a spirit, and a spirit that allowed her to, uh, uh, they, they, they call it divination, um, to, to be able to discern the future and uh, to, to bring fortune to bear. And um, so we talked a little bit about that. We talked about the, the presence of evil. And um, so let's start back there. We'll read back a couple of scriptures over last week and then move forward with that. So that at verse 16, one day as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and uh, brought her and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. And she kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. So that was the last part of it we read. And I had a thought about you and your, your talking in this sermon this morning about getting upset. Well, here's Paul getting upset. Yeah. He's doing something about it. Yeah. Yeah, Paul, Paul's getting annoyed. And uh, he's very much annoyed. And he turned around and says to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And uh, it came out of her that very hour. The spirit uh, that was within her gave her a sense of uh, being able to, to tell the future. And because of that, it uh, made money for her, her owners, uh, for whom she was a servant. Um, I think... You know, the degree to which people um, have power and control over others in their life um, is, I mean, it's, a, it's an evil presence, an evil power. And, um, and that was what was exerted over this woman, this young woman. And her owners, uh, they profited from it. Um, it's, it was a sense that was, that was true. Uh, the spirit was able to discern that, that Paul and the, and the others are, are servants of the Lord Most High, that they're proclaiming a way of sal salvation. Uh, this, this spirit is able to see truth there. And, um, and yet, Paul calls the spirit out of her in order that she can be set free. Um, set free from the bondage of slavery and uh, to be able to have a life of, of normalcy. So we, we see that that's what comes about. And in doing so, uh, her owners are not pleased. In verse 19 it says, But when her owners saw 
that, the, that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. So they're, they're bringing a suit, a case, against uh, Paul and Silas. And the, the case is that, that they're no longer able to profit off of this girl because of, of, uh, of what they've done. And when they brought uh, them before the magistrate, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. And so they're saying they're practicing something that's totally different than what we practice in our culture, in our community. And because of that, you know, we want you to, to take care of them. And the crowds joined in in attacking them. And so the magistrates, the, that's the city leaders, uh, had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with a rod. And after they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into the prison and ordered the jailer keep them uh, securely. And following these instructions, he put them in the inmost sail and fastened their feet to the stockings. And so they are held and bound uh, fast in place. Uh, there's no way for them to secure their freedom because they have uh, dared to speak a word against this evil spirit and to allow this young woman to be set free. Um, so they're, they're held. Uh, on, on behalf of the faith, I think sometimes uh, we incur the wrath of, of other people whenever we act in ways that are faithful to what Christ calls us to, to live. Um, here we see that that uh, she's going along behind Paul and Silas and, and uh, declaring who they are to all the people. And I suspect at first that doesn't seem to bother them, but little by little it begins to, to wear on them. And so Paul calls the Spirit out and in doing so um, allows for this young woman to be set free. And, in, and, and because of her freedom then they end up in bondage. Isn't that, it's kind of ironic. Um, the freedom that Christ brings to us in our life causes Paul and Silas to be bound and to be thrown into prison. Um, they're not alone. That's right. Uh, you know, it feels, it feels that way as they lead us up to this point, doesn't it? Um, they're stripped of their clothes. They're beaten. They're locked up, they're chained, fasten their feet to the stocks. I mean, they are chained down. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure, I'm not sure why I really started thinking about this, but in the last several years, um, I've watched as uh, things have occurred on television and people have been arrested and I see them bound, you know, with their hands behind their back and put into the back of a car and the doors locked to where they can't get out. Um, I've, I've not really been claustrophobic in my life, but recently I see that kind of thing and I think, how would I respond to that? Um, I, I, I begin to feel more and more like I, uh, like I, I, I would not be able to control myself if I were were locked up, uh, thrown into prison. Um, I, you know, I hope I'm, you know, never in my life am I led to that place. But uh, I begin to wonder more and more, um, how would I respond to, to being locked up into a small cell, chained where I couldn't move? Um, Restricted on what you can do and what choices you have. And sure. What you can eat. And Everything. Have have you ever thought about that? I and mean, how uh, do you ever feel claustrophobic in your life? What would it be like to be locked up, uh, to be put into prison? Just a small little area that you could be within, and to know that that's because of your faith that you were locked up. 
Uh, maybe that helps. Maybe if you're locked up because you did something wrong, you feel... Uh, feel like maybe you deserve it. But if you're locked up because of your faith, because you've done something that was following Christ's leading in your life, uh, maybe you feel like you can take on those bounds. Uh, I, I think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a pastor who was standing up for the civil rights movement and thrown into prison. He wrote the letter to the church from the Birmingham jail. Um, he wrote to the church leaders uh, because he thought they were being too moderate in their response to uh, the issues of, of uh, segregation. And he was willing to go all the place, all the way to the place of prison, being in prison uh, because of his convictions. I've read a lot of several stories about the POWs from Vietnam mm -hmm. era, and their faith and being able to recite Bible verses is what got them through that type of imprisonment and very, very difficult circumstances and beatings and all. Uh, because Jesus was there with them in effect, they were able to hold up and get to it. Knowing that as you go there, you go there with Christ as a presence with you gives you strength. Yeah, that's, I, I, think, I think that's the only way I can imagine making it through. Um, honestly. And, and so many of our prisoners now that don't have that to do with them, mm -hmm. that's what makes their stay there it would be hard for me. I know that. They don't have to wait too long, though. Um, it says after midnight. You know, you get to, to midnight and, and, uh, and things begin to change. After midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So there, the two of them are singing hymns to God while in prison. Um, you know, that's, that's the sense of knowing you're not alone there. Um, and the prisoners who are kept there for lots of other reasons, they're, they're hearing and they're listening. And suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Now, this is not the first earth earthquake in the book of Acts, is it? Uh, this is the second time that they've been in prison and the earthquakes before it was Peter. Uh, now we have uh, Paul and Silas and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. Uh, so much so that the very chains that bind them are broken open and they're set free. And when the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Um, what shame he must have felt uh, knowing that, that these prisoners were, were free and it was under his watch. He pulls the sword and is about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights. And rushing in, he fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Here's a, a man who had no experience of the faith, who has no tradition. Uh, he's not Jewish. There's no connection that makes sense. And yet he sees in this moment uh, God's acting in history and God uh, bringing about their freedom. And, and, and he understands it. He understands what's going on. And so he wants to respond. And he asks how or what must I do uh, to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You 
and your household. Not just to him, but it'll extend out to his whole family. And they can be included in salvation. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And at the same hour of the night, he took them and he washed their wounds. You know, it said they'd been stripped and they'd been beaten. And so he cleans their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. This is the middle of the night. Um, can you sense the, the urgency that he's feeling? Uh, the chains are broken. The doors are open. They are set free. And he understands that this is a part of the, the working of, of God in the world. And he wants to be a part of it. And so he asks to be baptized. Not just him, but his entire family and household. And that night, they then proclaim the gospel to them. And they are baptized. And he brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. Um, I think that's how salvation happens. Um, one person begins to know the work of Christ in their life. And they influence the rest of their family. They bring the rest of their family to the place of faith. Uh, one person who has enough conviction that they're willing to push forward and, um, and they respond. And because of what's going on in their life, the rest of their family responds to it. They, they make it such a central part of their life. I, I've told you the, the story in, in worship about a, uh, a woman who started coming to church at a church I was at. Her name was Mary Lee. And for weeks, she came by herself. And after several weeks, she began bringing her two grandchildren, Lauren and Elizabeth. And so Mary Lee came, and Lauren and Elizabeth came. And for probably a month or two, the three of them came. And after a while, because Lauren and Elizabeth were coming, Pam and Steve, Lauren and Elizabeth's parents, started coming. Mary Lee's daughter and son-in-law. And so the one person who responded out of some prompting in her heart to come to church in faith, to see something in Christ that was drawing her, because she responded, her two grandchildren were raised in the church, and then her daughter and son-in-law started coming to church. And then her sister-in-law, Dorothy, started coming as well. And pretty soon... This whole pew in the church that had been sitting empty was full with this one family that had been influenced by one person's responding in faith. It really is that simple. It's that simple that one of us begins to, to hear and see God at work in the world and because we respond, uh, those around us begin to follow and respond as well. Yeah. I, I think it's a, it's a really dramatic story. Uh, here, this family, because the jailer has this experience, the whole family comes to the faith and they experience salvation. Um, have you known anybody in your life that was that way? That uh, just in responding to Christ at work in their life began to influence other people? To, to bring them into the church and into the faith? Who were you thinking? I said probably we do, but I can't remember. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> some of us, you know, we, some of us grew up outside of the faith. Some grew up inside. Some of us, we came to church from when, the very beginning. Um, I think I've told you the story of whenever I was a baby, before my parents, my father was raised Baptist, my mother was raised Methodist, and they hadn't really decided what church they were going to be a part of. So whenever they had a child, they began to uh, have to start making those decisions. And my mom will say, 
She whispered in my ear, you are a Methodist. <laughs> and, and that kind of led us to coming to the Methodist church. Um, when one of us has a tie in faith, a connection in faith, it begins to pull the whole of the family in that way. And the jailer does that. He sees God at work in this setting free of Paul and Silas, and it pulls his whole family into an experience of salvation. And because of that, his children, their children, are going to be raised in the faith, and they're going to know not have to come to it late in life, but they're going to know from the very beginning Jesus' love for them and what God has done for them through Christ. Um, it's a powerful thing whenever we're able to experience that. Some of my earliest memories, I think I was about three or four years old, and... <clears throat> We were still staying in Shamrock where my grandparents lived. And there was a small, white Methodist church, the old style Methodist church with the steeple and all. And I can remember Grandma and Daddy Bill taking us there and me playing with the kids. And, and that was fun because mm -hmm. where I out at grandma's and grandpa's they didn't have anything but the bird dogs to play with just yeah like, you know a lot so uh, but we would go there and i got to play with other kids and, and, and sit there with them in church that early experience of being a part of church uh, helped shape shape your life and your faith and that's a, that's important in ways that we really can't even understand uh, that are, keep that up. Somehow along about college, I sort of drifted away from some of that. Right, sure. To come back. Yeah, <laughs> and as is often the case for us, we, we sometimes have times when, periods when we drift away from faith, but that foundation that is there, um, when they say, you know, if you raise up a child in the faith, that they will remember that, and they'll keep their ways, and... Um, to any of us who've raised up children who uh, have been a bit rebellious, um, you know, we remember that and we, we, we take some comfort in it. And, um, you know, I can, I can speak from my own experience that that was the way in which, um, you know, we were able to see our kids return to faith uh, because they were raised in it. And, and though there might be a time that they pull away and drift away. It's those deepest foundations that were planted in their life that uh, have the deepest roots and seem to, to take a bigger influence in their life than anything else. And, and I, I, it's just, imp it's amazingly important. Um, it doesn't always feel like it every day from day to day. We don't always know the degree to which those influences continue to, to, to take hold and lead in their lives, but they do. And um, this jailer and his family are baptized and they're brought into faith. And because of that, a whole line of people are brought into uh, the experience of who Jesus is. I was told one time that the verse, spare the rod, spoil the child, the rod is scripture. And by reading scripture to the child and teaching them through God's word, the child is not spoiled. Right. Yeah, I I think it's it's clear that um that if we have the experience of faith, we need to make sure we pass that on and that we, we give that to our, our children and our children's children. And, and that whenever that's planted in their life early, it's hard for that to go away. Um, there can be times of rebellion and leaving, 
But then there comes a time of return. And that time of return is whenever those deepest foundations that were built, uh, are, are, they show to be true. In verse 35, it says, When morning came, and the magistrate sent the police, saying, Let these men go. And the jailer reported the message to Paul, saying, The magistrate sent word to let you go. Therefore come and now, uh, come out now and go in peace. But Paul replied, They have beaten us in public, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And now, are they going to discharge us in secret? Certainly not. So Paul's about to be set, set free. Uh, the jailer says, come and, uh, and let yourself uh, go free and go in peace. But Paul says, you know, we're citizens of Rome. Uh, and they treat us, treated us this way, even without convicting us. You know, they've, they've uh, beaten us in public as people who are uncondemned, citizens of Rome. Um, certainly not. So he, he's contending against them. You know, the courts have already decided, the magistrates, the city leaders, uh, let them go. And yet he's, he's, he's calling for a protest. Let them come and take us out themselves. So he's saying, we'll stay in prison. We'll stay locked up. Let them come, you know, don't just turn us out without any fanfare. Let them come and take us out themselves. And the police reported these words to the magistrate. And they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. And so they came and apologized to them. So Paul and Silas get the city leaders that all come down from town hall and they uh, apologize to them for locking them up uh, because of this complaint that was charged against them. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. Please leave. Just get us free from all this trouble. We don't want any more trouble with you. We'll take you out. We'll pay for your way to get out of town. Um, and after they leave the prison, they went to Lydia's home. And when, uh, when they had seen and encouraged the brothers and sisters there, they departed. So they stayed long enough to go to visit Lydia and to visit with the other Christians who were gathered in that community. And they gave them words of encouragement. And after building them up, uh, they departed for their next part of their journey. Um, I think that's the part of the Christian faith and community that uh, is really important about the church. That they get reconnected, they talk with the others who are part of the faith, and before leaving, they make sure that they leave on good ground and they've given a word of encouragement and they've headed, headed on down the road. Um, one of the things that I, oh, I get kind of distressed about in the church um, is you'll see people come into the life of the church and the life of faith and then soon they'll move on to another town or some other place. And um, I think, gosh, we all that work, you know, we're building them up to be members of the church and to build them up in faith, and now they've moved on to another place, and we don't get to enjoy the benefit of that. Um, I don't know if you ever feel that way. Uh, I've, there are several members who uh, were here, you know, recently, and have moved on to other communities. A job has taken them away. Family connections have taken them, moved them on to another a community. And you think, um, you know, they were here and they were part of the church and they came in as such babes. And we helped to encourage their faith and raise them up. And they were part of Sunday school and a part of worship. And uh, they went on the walk to Emmaus and you see how much they've grown. 
And now they moved on to some other church. We watered them and fertilized them and they moved on. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 part of that, you know, you feel like doggone it, you know. We didn't get to see the full maturity. Um, but but that's part of the journey of the church is that we get to be a part of it for this time. And while we help them grow and mature, they get to go on and help lead some other place. Uh, we benefited in this church from leaders who didn't get raised up in this congregation. They got raised up in another place, in another church. And they came to a place where they had leadership ability and they came in and stepped into roles of leadership here that they never got to do over there. And in the same way, we have people we helped raise up in faith and get them ready. And then when they move on to those next communities, they get to be in that role of leadership. And um, we, we, we don't get to feel sorry for ourselves. Um, sometimes we might want to. You know, we might want to say, oh, shucks, you know, couldn't they have just gotten to that place before they left so that we could have experienced the fullness of their faith here? Um, Dad and I was just talking a while ago about when we have somebody come here and we work with them and, and do things for them to help their lives, and they appreciate it for a while. And then they kind of forget that. They get sidetracked a little bit. Yeah. And it's a little bit more. We've had a number of people that have had that happen here. I can imagine a few that you were thinking of, I bet. And, and that, that surely is the case. Yes, and it, it hurts. Yeah. Sometimes we don't get to see the fullness. Sometimes we are like Paul, you know, that, that, that we water and we help raise them up, but we don't get to enjoy the harvest. And, and hopefully that's the case with those who we think of. Um, that, that there's a lot that we did. We encourage them. We help them grow in their understanding of the faith. Even as they maybe had taken steps and wandered away, um, we hope that they'll return and that we'll get to see that. But, that. but that return may be to a different church community and a different place of faith further down the road than we get to ever know. Um, maybe one of these days they'll be in a Bible study and they'll say, you know, if it weren't for Ed Chamberlain and you know the, uh, all those folks, the parishes back there taking care of me and helping me out, I'm not sure I'd have ever been able to come back to, to church. Um, they showed me what true faith was all about. We certainly hope so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do too. I do too. Um, I, both, in both of those ways, you know, people who I know we've helped raise up, and I know they're going to be leaders in the church down the road, that we don't get to see their leadership role. But, they, but it's because they were a part of us that they got to that place. And those that um, were here with us for a while and seemed to have drifted off. But um, I just hope that the place comes back to where they were able to return to faith. Yeah, to me, what I'm missing most was choir members. Yeah. And they have good choir members, they have good choir, and they're good on good. They said they don't. Yeah. Yeah, and you know we've seen our choir, uh, we've seen it grow, and we've seen it kind of contract, and um, you know we we hope that we can can bring in new people to get it connected and a part of that. Um, yeah, so many places and communities and connection. Um, that gets us to the the end of of chapter sixteen. Um, Thank mm -hmm. you.